Steve Hendricks, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. Thanks, Howie. It's so good to be with you. Yeah, so uh, your book is fantastic. The Oldest Cure in the World, Adventures in the Art and Science of Fasting. And I have to admit that I almost uh, emailed you uh, on Saturday and tried to reschedule. And the, the reason is I, I generally assume three hours for a nonfiction book about health. <laughs> and four pages in, I was like, shit, this is really well written. This is interesting. This is fun. I'm not going to skim this. And I actually finished like at quarter to 10 today. So 45 minutes before our conversation. It is such a great book. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of great health books out there, um, and a lot of them are written by, you know, doctors and health professionals and so on, who are uh, very capable writers. But um, I, I was looking for something a little more than just the prescriptive how-to book, and I really tried to craft this as a work of narrative nonfiction that could be read by anyone who just appreciated a good story, in addition to all the people, of course, who are looking to improve their health. Um, so it's I'm, I'm I cannot tell you how you have touched my heart <laughs> to um, to say that I seem to have uh, pulled that off for you. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. I kept on calling. I was really annoying my wife. Like, honey, listen to this line. <laughs> yeah, my wife. We just got the stack of books uh, in in our house uh, this past week, and my wife, who's my first and and best reader, um, reread it again, and she just. <laughs> every so often would chuckle and I'd have to interrupt her and say, you know, what are you chuckling about? And she'd say, oh, it's this line. I'm like, oh yeah, that, that was a favorite of mine mm -hmm. too. <laughs> so yeah, that's well, great. She, she definitely comes off well in the book. So at, at well, your good. expense she... often. <laughs> <laughs> as, as it should be. Yes, yes. No, no one wants to read the other way around. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, I mean, I was, you know, I, I, it was almost like it was the the biography of an idea in that, you know, like Malcolm Gladwell would write a book or, or Michael Lewis about like one person as being the center theme throughout. And you do that, a, you know, a teeny bit with Goldhammer, but most, you know, most each each section has its own heroes and villains. But what keeps coming up is this idea that fasting is can be really good for us when done intelligently. And the resistance to it throughout history has has proven almost insurmountable in, in getting it out to the masses. So I'm, I'm wondering, what, what was your goal in writing the book? Yeah, so my goal, of course, was just bringing the story of fasting to more people. I mean, that, that was the broad goal. But you've, you've really hit it on the head. There, there is this, um, well, there's a, a great misconception, a great many misconceptions about fasting. And what I wanted to do was to clear some of those up. And if there is a central and kind of recurring theme to it, it is this fact that on the one hand, we have this, this cure. Fasting can protect and it can uh, protect us from diseases that we don't yet have. And it can reverse some diseases that we do have. It is a very powerful tool. Um, on and off throughout the ages, this has been known and lost. Mostly in the past, it wasn't known. But now we, we know it for a fact. We have the science to back it up. And yet, on the other hand, it has been resisted and rejected over and over and over again, particularly by the medical establishment. Um, you know, unfortunately, we live in an age where the medical establishment uh, loves pills and procedures and so on. If you're just saying, look, the body itself has this regenerative capacity if we treat it right, as you well know, that's what eating plants does. Uh, it it, it, it uh, supports these uh, regener regenerative processes, but fasting can, can amp that up to the nth degree. Um, but if, if it's the body that's doing the healing, doctors aren't so excited. So, uh, you know, it, it has not caught fire, let's put it that way. But also there's this sort of this bigger story that um, that is not just about uh, curative fasting. That's most of the book. Most of the book is about fasting as a therapy. But a big chunk of it, when I went back and was looking into the history, because the full history of fasting just really hasn't been told anywhere all in one book, I found that there was so much more to it. There was, of course, the religious fasting uh, is the second biggest piece. Um, and then there were other sort of forms of sort of uh, performative fasting that people would do. 
Uh, and those ended up fascinating me. Um, I was most interested in the health and I thought that stuff would bore me, but in fact, it ended up being fascinating and often, to, to be honest, a, a pretty uh, sad and brutal story, m most, of, uh, most of our history. Yeah, um, the, you know, as a, as a history major, <laughs> Having studied, you know, I think my my year was 363 CE. Um, so I was fascinated to come across these characters that I had met in my research in a completely different yeah. setting. So John Chrysostom and Philo and, and folks like that. Um, so one, one of the things that occurred to me, like straight off the bat, is that your book kind of, it was almost like f fasting of facts that like so many facts about fasting didn't survive the <laughs> the research that you did. And so what did survive came out much stronger. It's, you know, it's a very credible book because of so much debunking that you did. So the, fir the first debunk that I had to, you know, put the book down and, you know, take smelling salts to recover from was that Hippocrates never said, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food or primum non nocere, first do no harm. So, <laughs> right. and, and in doing so, you, you immediately call into question the veracity of every book on fasting that's ever been written that repeats those um, unquestioningly. So what, what, did, what did you, like, what, what happened when you started looking and realizing that there was a, a large house of cards there? Yeah, I mean, it, it is rather disorienting, right? When you um, take people who are even even scholars will repeat those lines by Hippocrates, and, and you hear all of these, you know, as you know from having read it, there are uh, dozens of these stories where you know Pythagoras was said to have fasted for forty days, been made to fast for forty days before he became a student in Egypt, and he complied grumpily, but then he liked it so much that he. Uh, forced his own students when they would come to study with him to fast for 40 days. Not a word of it's true, right? Um, so, you know, story after story, you you come to and you find, well, that's not true. That's not true. Personally, just on the behind the scenes writing end of it, what it meant was this was an enormous project because I had to double and triple fact check every single fact that I came across. And likely as not, a lot of the facts weren't true. And the sad um, problem with this, had I written this book 20 years ago, which I couldn't have because the science <laughs> for most of what I write, am writing about hadn't uh, blossomed in the way that it has for fasting, but the history was all there. Had I written it 20 years ago, it would have been a lot easier. What has happened is, as we know, one, you know, the internet can be a beautiful thing, as I hope we're demonstrating now, but one a piece of the internet is it's a machine for replicating lies. And so the problem that happens is one of these things gets out there, like that line about Hippocrates, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. Someone says it, and then it gets repeated and repeated and repeated ad nauseum. And I don't know if you noticed in one of the um, notes there, I you know even uh, cited this, uh, this uh, Colombian researcher, researcher down in Colombia, who had written an entire article debunking that entire line, <laughs> published in a peer-reviewed journal in the scientific literature. It doesn't matter. You still find that quoted absolutely everywhere. So it's an important lesson to me um, that, you know, I, I, I hate to say this, but question everything you read. And certainly um, one of the sadder things is, is, is not so much, it's, it's a bit understandable if on a Reddit thread, people are um, repeating that stuff. It's appalling to me that you find um, academics and um, folks who should know better doing it. I will plead guilty. Um, this book evolved out of, a, um, out of a piece that I wrote for Harper's Magazine 10 years ago. Um, and in that piece, I repeated that story about Pythagoras that I just told you in the 40 day fasting thing. I looked at what I thought were a couple of credible sites. Harper's Magazine has fact checkers. They looked at, you know, a couple of credible citations, the credible citations that I claimed as well. They cleared it, said, yeah, it's good. Unfortunately, you really have to go pretty deep into the weeds to make sure that you've got the whole story. And part of the reason that I did that was just I, I hope to try to set some of that historical record as straight as I could. But I also did that in order to establish some credibility to say, look, I'm, I'm, I'm setting you up here that I'm, that I'm 
that I'm putting this historical story as straight as I can possibly get it. I hope that gives you some trust in me that when I get to the science of fasting later in the book, that you trust that as well, because uh, there is, if there's a misinformation about the history of fasting, oh my God, is there misinformation out there about how to fast and what we know about how to fast and how not to fast? Yeah. And I think, you know, that's exactly how I took it. Like, oh, this, this guy is not, is, you know, there's no sacred cows here. Um, everything's up for grabs. And then, you know, I, then I, I quickly grew delighted by your take on sort of religion in general, to, you know, to sort of, you know, enlightened skepticism, and, you know, uh, laced with, with acerbic wit. Um, for a while, I think, you know, I assumed you were Jewish because of the, of the, the um, you know, the facile way you were kind of dismissing a lot of the, the rabbinic arguments. Um, so I, I assumed you studied <laughs> Talmud at some point, but uh, you've, you've picked it up somewhere. W one thing I did not know um, about my own uh, history is, is what an asshole Philo was. <laughs> <laughs> So he, he was this, this Hellenized Greek Jew. And so like, oh, we're proud of him. He writes, he's influential. And, you know, in all my studies, I never, never um, came across his, his extreme misogyny. The, and, and that, which brings up, uh, I guess I'm saying this because there's a, along with fasting, there's a lot, you know, this positive thing that, that biologically is, can be so good for us. There's this whole accretion of, of philosophies that have come attached to it that that really distort its purpose and how we can think about it. And one of them was you know, women should fast so that basically men don't get hot when they look at them. That's that's really true. And, you know, I'm, I'm of course, only presenting the fasting side of the story. No doubt Philo has his virtues and he said some decent things. Right. Um, but in a. Uh, big, thick book. As you know, this is a meaty book. You know, you have to pick and choose what you put in. So I just put in the fasting side of Philo and there he, you're right. He's a complete ass. Um, it is interesting. So, you know, if, if you picked two themes across the religions where fasting really took hold, okay, one of them would be its, its propensity to expand. And that completely makes sense. If you decide that by denying yourself, you are becoming closer to God. You are having a holier experience. Well, if a little bit of denial is holy, well, then a lot of denial must be even holier. And so it has this capacity to grow and grow and grow. People get into more extravagant fasts. The institutions that run those religions, you know, require more fasts and so on. So that happened both, for instance, in Hinduism, where there ended up being, I forget the number that I that I found in there, but some calendars in the in in uh, ancient Hinduism that had 140, 150 days of fasting uh, each year on the calendar. Um, same with Christianity. In some Christian calendars, there were as many as 220 days of fasting on the calendar. But the other, to me, um, striking and shocking and tragic piece of this was, big surprise, fasting is not pleasant with people. So the men who ran these religions decided that fasting would be best for the women to do, not so much for the men. The men were expected to fast some, but it wasn't to be taken uh, as a way of life. And um, this was, you're absolutely right, thanks to Philo. It's interesting, Jesus did not you know, build, Jesus was pretty uh, uh, bland about fasting. He just didn't have much to say for it. He, he surely did it, but it was not a big deal. Um, and that was true also of the very earliest Christians. For instance, Paul doesn't have any, thing interesting to say about fasting. But later Christians pick up this stuff from Philo, this Hellenized Jew in Alexandria. And they one of the things they pick up, as you say, is that fasting can be used as a tool to curb lust. Lust being seen, of course, as something deeply sinful. But it, it's not a tool to curb male lust, although sure, it'll do that. And men should probably fast here and there and so on. But it's really a tool to dry up the moist humors inside women. It was literally meant to eradicate womanhood, womanhood to shrivel breasts and pair hips and buttocks and in menstruation. And uh, women were supposed to strive for this. 
Um, and this was not supposed to be a punishment for them. You see, they, they were supposed to, uh, uh, do this, um, in order to reap the reward of becoming a bride of Christ. Uh, mm. and as I say in the book, some of the creepiest writings in antiquity are, um, these passages by some of these worked up you know, self-stimulated male theologians talking about what was going on between these brides of Christ and Christ uh, when they were united in their bridal chamber, just really erotic, weird, bizarre stuff. Um, but, but, you know, I'm not, I'm not here to suggest that every single girl and woman uh, from, let's say, 100 AD through about 1600 AD, you know, fasted themselves to a near oblivion. What I'm saying is that was the ideal that was held up to them for about 1500 years. They, and, and to the extent that they didn't live up to that ideal, which most of them didn't, but they were made to feel like they had sinned, that they were failures, that they were somehow impure. So the body shaming that we have going on today, which primarily affects women, um, this is nothing new. It was different. It wasn't, you know, you should be skinny in order to be hot, but it was you should be wasted in order to be pure and chaste and safeguard your virginity and keep the men from getting uh, eager and ooing and aahing over you. Um, and, and I thought that that was a story that in all the books that I had read about fasting, non-academic -ac books anyway, uh, had really just never been brought out. Um, and it is such, uh, it, it was such a visitation of awfulness upon women and girls. Um, and I thought it needed to be told. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, it was hard to read about Jerome and Pelagia, Jerome, the, the church father who, uh, who created, I guess, the, the Vulgate, uh, the first mass translation of, of the Bible. And this woman that he basically okay. tortured to death through uh, convincing her to fast more and more. Um, it's yeah. yeah, go ahead. Just, yeah, that, that was, um, it, what's interesting about that was that was such a, uh, you know, uh, horrifying event at the time that, um, this was in, in Rome and the council of Rome, um, expelled him. He was, he was exiled for the rest of his life. Um, so you, when you see that, you think, oh, well, there, there, maybe there was some good sense that was going to prevail, but you know, guess what? You know, it was Jerome who was later canonized, made a saint by the church. And eventually it was Jerome's vision that took over the church. Yeah. So, and I see echoes of this in the modern vegan movement, not, you know, not necessarily so overt, but sort of these impulses for purity, for positioning yourself as more pure than the next person. I, I, I loved your footnote when you mentioned that you were having a tablespoon or two teaspoons of honey and like, yeah, vegan eating honey. Yes. Like, like you're, you know, um, you're not trying to be the most vegan vegan ever of all time. <laughs> but I, I, I see that a lot. I see the desire to, you know, like some vegans, the movement likes to talk about you can have all this yummy food, you can indulge, you can eat the same, you know, have more pleasure than. Other. But there's also, you know, tension in the movement about no SOS versus this is too strict versus it's keeping people away. The same things that we're arguing about, you know, in second century Christianity about are we, you know, how are we going to get the pagans if they if they look at this as a a religion of, of deprivation and denial. I just see so, so many historical parallels. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right. And I think one of the, um, one of the, the common reasons for that from whether it's uh, ancient Christianity or modern veganism is um, both of those, uh, you know, sets of people feel like they're part of it. it a movement whose importance cannot be understated. You know, if you're if you feel like you have the the uh, the key to the kingdom of heaven, <laughs> and everyone else who doesn't you know follow through the gate you're opening up is going to hell. Well, goodness gracious, you're going to want to be as pure as possible, and it's the same thing with veganism. Um, the the and quite understandably, I think, my goodness, you know, the 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 reasons for being vegan, whether you are doing it for the animals, whether you're doing it for health, whether you're doing it for the planet. Um, all three of those are just dire imperatives in, in our age. So it's very understandable to me 
that people would be uh, very dogmatic and, as you say, want to be the most vegan of vegans. I certainly have um, struggled with that at times myself. Um, but, you know, you're right. It, it, it helps, I think, to have a little humility and take things with a grain of salt. I'm not advocating for, you know, so go out and have a steak, every, you know, every other week or something. It's, it's, it's not what I'm saying, but I'm saying for those who do, um, maybe we can recognize that someone who's 85% vegan um, is, you know, a lot more on our side and helping the planet and helping the animals a lot more than someone who's 0% vegan. Right. And I've seen this at um, sort of vegan events that, you know, lots of you know, people gather and the, the famous doctors and nutritionists and uh, chefs all show up. And I've seen like on panels, you can just see where un almost unconsciously everyone's jockeying to be the most pure. Like I remember being part of a panel where they're arguing about whether blenders are evil, you know, because they're <laughs> pre masticating and kind of. <laughs> You know, I think there's lots of different ways to 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 go about it, but being just being aware of these psychological influences. I think you know from uh, you know David Graeber and David Wengro in the the Dawn of Everything talk about this natural tendency among groups to distinguish themselves from each other, and that you right. know veganism can easily like lurch in those directions as opposed to keeping its eye on the goal. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And part of the reason for that conflict is the natural thing of those different groups. Some of them have different goals. Um, so, you know, uh, in general, everyone wants to live the long as long as they can. But, you know, that might uh, have a different there, there might be different things, different variables that feed into that that will get you there that differ from we want to save the most animals or we want to um, you know, use the, the fewest resources on the planet. So, you know, I, you know, on that blender mastication, pre-mastication debate, it's hilarious, right? It's ridiculous. On the other hand, that is an important scientific question, right? So, right. um, you know, it, it, if someone said to you, Howie, you know, you're going to live three years longer if rather than blending those things into a smoothie, you're going, if you just, ate those things because it gets your digestive system warmed up or, you know, whatever all the other arguments are, you're going to say, all right, I guess I'll stop blending the smoothies, right? I think the problem comes when we really don't have any idea, right? We, we, well, I, well, let me go back a step. We have some ideas. We don't have compelling, convincing science that's going to tell us. And for some of these questions, we may never do it. Um, in the fasting world, what comes to my mind, I was reading a little debate last night between some people that went on a few years ago online uh, about whether when fasting to drink distilled water or whether to drink bottled water, you know, that has more minerals in it. The people who were opposed to the distilled water were calling it, uh, you know, neutralized dead water that had no nutritional value. And, you know, you absolutely need these minerals that, you know, bottled spring water has in it and so on. Um, those are interesting questions. I, I would like an answer to that question myself as someone who fasts. But when you don't know the answers, you know, when we don't have science that can tell us, oh, here's the answer to that question, well, then you need to approach it all with a little more humility and a little more caring and understanding of the person who's on the other side of the debate from you. But boy, is that really hard to do. And it's, I think, even harder to do in this loud and screaming Fox News, MSNBC internet age. Yeah, that's why you know one of one of the heroes of the book for me was Herbert Shelton, who yeah. was uniquely willing to say what that he didn't know what he didn't know, and to express the limitations of fasting as opposed to, you know, even even someone like you 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 toss out a line about you know, Walter Longo, who is probably going to win a Nobel Prize for claiming his fasting mimicking diet is as good as fasting. So he doesn't have the evidence for that. And you understand the, the forces that move him in that direction. But just that 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 willingness to be humble um, was, you know, in Herbert Shelton, whom I knew about, but not not necessarily that, you know, especially comparing him to the to the hucksters of the fasting world, like Bernard McFadden um, was, you know, quite beautiful to read uh, about Shelton's life. Yeah. So, I mean, Shelton is in many ways a role model. He's also a cautionary tale in some ways, but I think for most of his life, truly a, a, an ideal. 
and he had, so, you know, Shelton, um, Shelton was born in the late 1890s in Texas, and he grew up and came to fasting, as a lot of people did, under the influence of Bernard McFadden, who you mentioned, who was this total showman, propagandist, uh, blowhard, the whole nine yards, um, uh, who had um, come to, to rise uh, in the, at the very start of the 20th century by um, building this empire that was based first on the muscle magazine, Physical Culture. Um, and, and everything he did was bombastic and over the top and extreme. However, he was right on some things. He was right that fasting was curative, but because he was so bombastic, um, doctors just couldn't hear him. The medical establishment scientists had no use whatsoever for him. Um, and Shelton grew up heavily influenced by McFadden. He uh, worked for McFadden, wrote, uh, uh, ghost wrote a column for McFadden, uh, in one of McFadden's many publications, um, but I think he saw all that and said, well, this isn't helping the cause at all. And so the right thing to do is to be as uh, forceful as you can be about fasting where we have some form of evidence to back it up. But where we don't, as just as you said, Howie, we need to be humble <laughs> and we need to acknowledge what we don't know. Um, and, you know, Shelton has this sort of reputation for being wildly anti-science and I, and I, I quote, I think uh, once or twice, you know, some of his, you know, inveighings against science, what he's really complaining about is the scientific establishment rejecting him. And he even tried uh, a few times to um, uh, work with some scientists uh, who were working in uh, nutrition or longevity or something like that. And, and no one would have anything to do with him. So he just on his own, you know, at first quietly, but eventually rather uh, loudly and broadly, um, uh, amassed this following through just simply writing and writing and writing everything that he knew about health. And some of it was amassed from, you know, taking past doctors, particularly from the 19th century, who had uh, observed certain things in patients, like, you know, if you have a typhus patient and you fast one and you feed the other, the one who fasts, somehow seems to get better quicker. So he would, he would amass this information and then he had his own clinical observations. And he put this out both in a, a monthly magazine that he produced for decades, but, but especially in his books. And one, I, one of what I think was the most admirable things about Shelton was he believed that the knowledge that humankind had amassed about health was the rightful property of all humanity. And so he didn't copyright almost none of his words. There were one or two of his books that went through a sort of more traditional publishing process and were copyrighted. But the, the other millions of his words, they're, um, they're all out there and most of them you can find online for free. It's, it's an awful lot to wade through. He certainly could have used an editor, um, but uh, he was just an admirable, admirable man. And he was widely followed. Uh, Gandhi wanted him to come to India uh, and uh, tour the country there for five or six years to spread his message of hygiene, which, by the way, wasn't just fasting. It was a, a, a philosophy of hygiene, which at that time meant essentially a, a, a very heavily plant-based diet and other forms of uh, things you would do with your lifestyle, like sunbathing a little bit each day and so on, and fasting when necessary. Um, you know, he was uh, responsible for uh, getting uh, the most prominent fasting doctors in uh, France and England started on their career because they had found his writings in their libraries back in their home countries of the one in France had come from Cairo, the one in England had come from India. He was, he was just enormously influential. And part of what made it so was he was humble, but he was also very direct and forceful about, look, we have a cure here that works. It often works better than medicines, certainly the medicines of that day and even many of the medicines of our day. Um, and he didn't back down and shy away from controversy, also didn't hesitate to say, you know what, this is something fasting can't fix or I tried with fasting, it didn't work. Uh, and that was a really refreshing uh, message for people to hear. Great. And as you point out, all the credibility that he brought to it didn't really make a whit of difference compared to Sylvester Graham and Jennings and Friedrich Hoffman and you know it didn't matter like it didn't matter what they did it's almost it's almost like when we talk about like democratic candidates for president 
like, well, no matter what, like they're they're all doing something wrong because none of them are getting elected. Like, oh, Bernie was this way and Pete was that way and Corey did this wrong. Like it almost didn't matter what any of them did or didn't do. There was there was such a, uh, you know, a, a virulent um, opposition in which, you know, you, you you know, you you bring in um, Upton Sinclair, who famously had the you know, inconvenient line, but also Frederick Hoffman was saying, you know, patients want a pill; they they don't want to pay me for for helping them. They want they want to feel like they got their money's worth. Yeah, partly it's the patients. Uh, many patients do very much, as we know, want a pill rather than you know, you if you told a patient, uh, I can reverse a lot of your health problems if you eat a minimally processed vegan diet, or I can give you a pill. I would guess about three quarters of Americans would probably go for the pill, <laughs> but the bigger obstacle really lies, I think, with the with the doctors themselves. And I, I begin the book in the, the the very front of the book, the front quotation that kicks off the book is this quotation by Goethe from the German writer Goethe from a an interview that he had had done. And what he basically said in that is that even in the sciences. Um, ideas are conceived as a form of property mm. and they are, you know, held tightly by scientists as tightly as, you know, virtually any other property and people cling to them and they refuse to let them go and they will um, hold on to them no matter what evidence you bring to bear against them. Right. And there's just something extraordinarily human about that. You, you latch on to an idea or to, for that matter, to, an education and a practice because doctors, they, they go to medical school for four years. They're told, you know, you can do this, you can do that, this pill, this procedure, whatever it is. And, um, and you will in effect be the hero of the story. Uh, when you tell them, well, actually, if you would just back off a lot of the time and not treat and fast instead and let the body be the hero of the story and let it heal itself, that could actually work even better in some cases, not all diseases. Fasting is not a cure all. But in many cases, that works better uh, with fewer side effects, less cost, on and on, right? That's a very hard thing for someone to tell who has invested all these years of education and however many years of practice they've been practicing when they, when they hear that. So, you know, one of the most, I think the book is, ends up being very hopeful, but one of the things that is most um, discouraging, I would have to say, is I would say so much of this was understandable until the, the 20th century um, because we didn't have any, any good science to um, support fasting for specific diseases. In the early 20th century, we start getting some science that fasting can reverse diabetes and that most dramatically fasting can reverse childhood epilepsy. Um, and then there are all these case studies of all these other diseases that we, that it seems uh, possible, probable that fasting cures. And then by the late 20th century, just in the last 20, 30 years, and especially in the last decade, oh my gosh, the, the science has gone through the roof. And we now have uh, very credible studies that fasting can reverse uh, rheumatoid arthritis, which any rheumatologist will probably tell you is irreversible, that it can... Uh, you know, cure high blood pressure, which affects half of all Americans, uh, American adults, uh, three quarters by the time you're in your 70s and high blood pressure contributes to half a million deaths in America a year. Uh, and the American Heart Association says there's no cure. It can only be managed by these uh, drugs, which happen to come from these drug companies that we take money from, but who knows if that's an influence or not. But, you know, so if we have these uh, studies that are, you know, pointing us in a, in a much smarter direction, and it is just not being heeded um, by the medical establishment. And you know what it what it will take to break through that wall of resistance to fasting, uh, if the science itself isn't doing it, I I'm not entirely sure. I I have a guess, and my guess is that it may simply require a changing of the guard because it seems as though Younger doctors, doctors who are being more exposed to a broader set of ideas when they go to medical school, not necessarily from the medical school. Maybe it's, well, as you know, from veganism, maybe they've watched Forks Over Knives. And so they're coming to their, you know, 
three minutes of nutrition or whatever they get now in medical schools and, and asking questions about, well, wouldn't a vegan diet help prevent cardiovascular disease and so on? I think something like that may happen with fasting, but I don't think that the science itself will be enough to penetrate the brain pans of uh, so many of these doctors, particularly long established ones. Yeah, I think I think that along with just the, the fact that Western medicine is just running out of runway to economically. Like it's, you know, what we're doing is unsustainable. It's, you know, it's almost like, oh, well, how, how are we going to change our, our, you know, energy consumption habits? Well, it's going to be forced upon us by more cataclysms and catastrophes that we can handle. Um, and I think you're right with the, with the younger generation of doctors. I mean, the practice of medicine has become a, a very unpleasant occupation for most of them through their seven minute visits and and um, most of their efforts spent on electronic health records and insurance billing. You know, a friend, a friend of mine manages practices, primary care practices for doctors just so they can do a little bit of what they were trained to do. Um, and then recently I watched the documentary Code Blue by Dr. Sarai Stancic, who is teaching lifestyle medicine to her interns. And you see like the joy returning to their faces like, oh, this is what I thought medicine was. It was talking to people and helping them heal. Um, so I think, you know, from from the from the ashes, hopefully we'll, we'll rise a changed guard um, that, that, you know, has has access to, to all the tools of lifestyle that we that we know about. Yeah, I mean, you're certainly right. I think one of the big lures of, um, you know, uh, getting doctors to um, use a plant based diet as therapy um, and to also use fasting as therapy is this there's this line, you know, it's exactly what you said that um, Dr. Michael Clapper, that Dr. Alan Goldhammer also uses. And it's it's basically, you know, you know, when Clapper's giving a speech, he often closes it by saying, so why did you become a doctor? Did you become a doctor just to use a certain technique or did you become a doctor to actually heal these people? And if you became a doctor in order to heal these people, why don't we actually do that? I'm giving you a tool here that can help you heal them. This will be so much more gratifying to you. And as Alan Goldhammer, who says, the the, doc, the founder and, and director of the True North Health Center, America's, America's largest uh, fasting center out in California, um, you know, as he says, you know, I've got the greatest job in the world. All my patients get well. Uh, what doctor can say that? Most patients are, most doctors are just, you know, sending their patients away with more drugs. They're setting them up for another procedure. And he has doctors coming up to him after his talks who say, uh, I've been treating diabetes patients for 40 years. I have never had one get well. And yet you're telling me your diabetes patients are getting well every single month of your job. And so that, I think, you know, you're absolutely right. These younger doctors are looking at these miserable working conditions for doctors and um, saying, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to be 40 years from now that doctor. I want to be the one whose patients are getting well. So I, you're right. Uh, the, the Western, med the failure of Western medicine in so many ways, certainly at preventive care um, is uh, unfortunately one of the great selling points of uh, fasting and vegan diet. So how did you discover fasting in the first place and what what attracted you to it or what made you feel like it was a, a necessity? Like, like I, and I'll, pre I'll preface yeah, so, that by, by saying that about a third of the book is your personal stories, um, which, are, you know, it's beautifully woven throughout the, his, the, the historical context. Oh, thank you. I, I was hoping that that would be. Uh, that my personal stories would be some leavening because some of the history can be kind of heavy, right? Um, so, um, so I came to fasting for two reasons. One was the reason that so many people do um, weight loss. Um, when I first came to fasting in my early 30s, I'm 52 now, um, uh, maybe later, mid mid to late 30s. Um, I weighed about 30 pounds more than I do now, and I wanted to get rid of the weight. Um, I'll, I'll say here that fasting can be a um, wonderful <laughs> tool for weight loss, particularly if you do prolonged fasting under medical supervision is the ideal. Um, but it's not uh, by itself, it's not a 
as as I, as I recount in the book, it's it's not a tool that will be um, sufficient alone to to um, sustain weight loss. It will absolutely you will absolutely lose weight. It's just a question of physics: calories in, calories out. If there's zero calories in and you're expending you know two thousand calories a day, you will lose a pound a day or thereabouts, right? So so that's great. But for keeping it off, it's it's not the the, the perfect tool, but it can be a help. Um, but the other reason I came to it was uh, in a in a sort of in a search for a way to live longer. Um, I have a an acute uh, fear of death, and I'd like to put off my date with the Reaper as long as I can. So from a, a sort of young age, I had been looking into ways to live longer. And the first thing I actually stumbled on was not fasting, but caloric restriction. And caloric restriction um, is fantastic for um, extending the lifespan. Scientists have known this for at least a century in all kinds of virtually every single lab animal it has ever been tried in. Uh, it also has some uh, potentially fantastic effects in humans, but my God, is it hard to do? You know, you're just, all it is, is just eating less every day. So if you're out there, you know, burning 2,500 calories a day, maybe your, your caloric restriction regime would be 1,500 calories a day. You live with a gnaw of hunger that is just <laughs> frankly miserable. Uh, and people who do CR for a long time tell me, oh, you sort of kind of get used to it, but yeah, it's sort of always there. And it didn't sound um, like a life worth living in the end to me. Uh, and I do like to eat. Um, so, um, but what I had then eventually found was fasting not only has many of the same protective and restorative effects uh, and, and additional ones probably that CR doesn't have, but it has many of the same ones that CR does have and then has additional ones that it, that it perhaps doesn't have um, without that hunger. Um, particularly if you're doing uh, what some people call intermittent fasting, what I call daily fasting, and what um, what some scientists call time-restricted eating, which is simply narrowing your eating window to a shorter number of hours a day than most people are used to. The ideal is probably six or eight hours, but anything under 12 hours of, an, of a daily eating window starts getting you some of these benefits. And, and, and sort of most wonderfully here, um, fasting actually does not cause hunger. Now, sure, you skip a meal or two, you, you might be hungry, right? But eventually what happens is in fasting, you go into ketosis, which most of your listeners probably know about. It's, it's where we break down our stored fat and use that for fuel. We don't actually use the fuel itself, the fat itself for fuel. We, we break it down into other fatty acids and so on. And some of these fatty acids are ketones and that's what the body is running on. Hence ketosis. Well, it turns out that ketones also suppress your hunger hormones. So, you know, I, for instance, uh, for the last few years have been eating in a six hour window and people say, well, what about the other 18 hours a day? Aren't you famished? And I say, in fact, no, I'm less hungry um, than I, than I was before when I was eating across, well, practically the whole day. Um, and studies have borne this out. They have borne it out both subjectively in you know, questionnaires that are given to people who are eating in a, say, a six hour window. Um, they're, they're not as hungry uh, later in the day. And it's borne out also by testing their blood and finding and the level of their hunger hormones. Is that because they're, they're in, in slight ketosis? Because I, th I thought that it's like, you know, eight, 18 hours is the first is the first transition. You need sort of three or four days to get into full on ketosis. But but intermittent TRE will, will do that as well. Yeah. So that's the really interesting thing. We tend to think I certainly did before I started research on this book as ketosis is almost an all or nothing thing. And and you're right. If you're doing a prolonged fast, it's going to take you until, you know, it varies by the person and the gender. But uh, till about day four, day five, to really get deeply into ketosis. However, we do start burning up um, some of our stored fat um, when we've used up our all of our glucose and all of our glycogen, glucose from the meals we eat, that's just the sugar in our meals. Glycogen is just the stored chains of glucose in our muscles and our liver. Um, and as we are using those up, it's more sort of like a, you know, a seesaw kind of thing where when one is going down, the other starts going up. So we don't burn many, um, a, a ton of fat on these longer fasts, uh, longer daily fasts, say for instance, an 18 hour uh, overnight fast. 
but we burn a little, we burn just enough. And apparently those, those, that small amount of ketones that we produce is just enough to take the edge off of those hunger hormones. Mm, gotcha. So what, one, one of the lines that really struck me in the book um, is your definition of hunger for the most part is the body expecting food rather than needing food. So this the the ketones kind of and, and the uh, the new schedule kind of retrains the body to not expect food. And therefore, there's no actual physiological hunger symptoms. Yeah, I mean, you know, it would be really nice if we could um, tell exactly what hunger has been at different points in our evolution, because clearly it is a tool, an evolutionary, you know, drive telling you, you need to eat, right? <laughs> so th there is a need to eat because you're hungry thing. However, we live in a developed society where abundance is all around us. There's too much food. Uh, it's, you know, never more than a few steps away for most of our, most of our lives. Right. And so I think, so that's what I was referring to. I think for most of us living in, in that kind of condition, you know, uh, it, hunger is this almost expectation. Um, and if you train your body to, um, I, I'm going out on a slight limb here. There's some science to support what I'm saying, but part of this is speculation. I think what happens though, is if you train your body repeatedly to expect food across 14, 15 hours a day, then it's going to expect food across that amount of time. There is some research to show that, you know, at the times that you habitually eat, your body will, will know that you're going to be having, you know, food coming and it will start, you know, preparing digestive juices in the stomach and some other uh, uh, digestive processes. Um, and those things cause you to say, to, well, to become hungry mm. and to say, well, it's time to go to the fridge, even when you probably don't need those calories. So yeah, one of the biggest surprises for me uh, in this book was um, how this all played out um, with, with the timing of our eating window each day. And so it turns out that our bodies are actually hardwired by our circadian rhythms to, um, to process nutrients from our food most efficiently in the morning and early afternoon. So what that means is, you know, most people who do intermittent fasting, time-restricted eating, they do it by skipping breakfast. They take their first meal at 11 o'clock in the morning or noon. They eat until six, seven, eight o'clock at night and then call it good. Well, it turns out the science is telling us that's not as healthy as if you shift that eating window earlier in the day. And so my eating window, I thought, I thought I would hate this. I was always a breakfast skipper. I love eating late at night. Turns out that's dreadfully unhealthy for you. So I go where the science goes and I tried it. Um, and I've been doing it the last two years, an eating window from about 8.30 in the morning till 2.30 in the afternoon. Easiest big change I've ever made. I was shocked at how easy it was. I was shocked at how great I felt. Um, it's been fantastic. I wouldn't trade it for the world. But where I'm going with all this, back to your point about hunger, is this minimization, minimalization of hunger appears to work best if you shift that eating window to line up with when our circadian rhythms are telling us to eat. So I think it is a whole lot easier not to feel hunger at, let's say, eight o'clock at night, nine o'clock at night before I go to bed, even though I haven't eaten in seven hours, than it is if you had that noon to 8 p.m. eating window and you woke up in the morning and your body is saying, hey, it's time to eat. It because it started all these biological processes. It's released uh, insulin from your pancreas in order to you know, move the food that it's expecting that's going to come out of your blood stream and into the cells. It's got those digestive juices flowing. It's got all these other processes going and saying, it's food time now. And people who, um, who complain about, God, I'm really grumpy, those th three or four hours before my noon eating window starts, mm. um, eating against your circadian rhythms may make that hunger problem worse. Eating with your circadian rhythms may make it easier. That's certainly where the early research seems to be pointing. Mm -hmm. Great. So, you know, I, I do want to say that the book really inspired me to want to do more fasting. Like, I think it's been two or three years since I've done a, a seven day fast. And one, one of the reasons that I haven't done it since is that the last time I did it, it took me about a month to feel totally recovered in terms of energy. So I don't, I, I don't know if I did it wrong or, or, but it's like, you know, 
do I want to spend that much? Um, but you, you know, partly you're telling the story of fasting and you're telling your own story, but there's also a lot, there's, there's a lot, like someone could read this book and be like, oh, I'm going to do this, like uh, the benefits, you know, across the board, mental health, physical health, energy, um, mental acuity. Um, are you concerned that people are going to like take this in their own hands and, um, you know, not, not seek, I mean, it's really hard to, to, to seek hard. medical supervision because there's only three places in the world we really can do it. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a real concern of mine that people will take the book and do something foolish, which is why I, I say in there, look, you know, first of all, obviously I'm not a doctor. I don't give medical advice, but I'll tell you what the fasting doctors say. And the fasting doctors who I have interviewed and respect um, are uniformly agreed that you should not fast for longer than a week on your own. Um, that's if you're healthy. If you have no diagnoses, if you have no suspected illnesses, if you're not on any medications or supplements, um, some doctors, Michael Clapper, for instance, will tell you, you know, you're good to fast for five, seven days on your own. All right. Alan Goldhammer, who we've talked about at, at True North in California, says no one should fast for more than about 18 hours on their own. And the reason he says that is there are a couple of very small groups of people, and these are truly minute, like to the diminishing point, who cannot process the, the byproducts of fasting, and they can actually go into a coma. Mm -hmm. um, he also says it because you tell someone like, uh, well, if you're healthy, you can fast a week. And they think, oh, of course I'm healthy. I mean, I, you know, I'm taking this, uh, these statins and uh, whatever else. And, you know, I have uh, angina when I walk up a hill or something. But, but you know, other than that, I'm just healthy. So people, um, I, I hate to say this, but sometimes when you're dealing with, you know, millions of people that you're speaking to or even hundreds, um, you can't, you, you have to err on the side of caution. So it isn't concern. On the other hand, I didn't want, again, I'm not a doctor. I'm not giving you advice. I'm telling you what the doctors, what their advice is. I didn't want to say um, uh, absolutely no, no one should ever fast unless they only fast at a fasting clinic, because what's the reality of that? The real, reality of that is health insurance doesn't cover it. Most people can't afford it. So what you're telling people is never fast, mm. right? So that has to be a decision that people have to make. I hope that I have given uh, uh, enough information for people to make an intelligent decision. I would encourage, uh, you know, if you can, to, to fast at a fasting clinic is fantastic. You know, um, I have had fasts as well, like, like yours, Howie, where it just takes a long time to recover. Um, and uh, that's one reason to fast with a fasting doctor, um, because that person can tell you, uh, or at least can come up with some, you know, hypotheses as to, you know, why that recovery is so long. Um, it shouldn't be if, if, if everything's going well, uh, that could be a sign that your body was trying to rid itself of something. And it still is when mm. you're um, uh, done with your fast, because the processes that you unleash during a fast continue afterwards. For instance, after you fast, you've, you've burned off all this material. Well, you need to regrow it. Well, uh, one of the beautiful things is post fast, your stem cells have sort of gotten ready during the fast and they're activated and they're growing healthy, happy new things, we hope. Um, and that will take some energy. Uh, and one thing that fasting doctors will absolutely recommend for an easier fast is rest. You know, treat yourself like you're at a spa. Don't work if you don't have to. If you have to work, don't overwork. You know, be exceedingly gentle to yourself because your body is doing an enormous amount of work during a fast. It's also true post fast. So, you know, advice like that from a doctor who's able to look at your particular circumstances and give it um, could be useful. Now, for those who can't, you know, take three weeks and go to a fasting clinic, you know, there are a ton of fasting clinics in Germany. Uh, we have, that I am aware of, only four in the United States. Uh, one in Ohio, one in Calif two in California, one in Puerto Rico. Um, there are um, a few places that will supervise your fasts remotely. Um, that's new. I think that really got going during the pandemic. And if you look at my website, which is stevehendricks.org, I'm not really trying to plug myself here, but truly go go to the Fasting Fact tab and I, I list the um, names and websites of those four places in the U.S., 
Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's not going to be free. Your insurance is almost certainly not going to cover 90% of it, but it would be a lot cheaper and a much easier option uh, for those people who would like to fast at home uh, with the guidance of a qualified fasting doctor uh, on the other end of the you know, Skype or Zoom. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned qualified fasting doctors. And one of the fascinating things about the book was your two experiences at this uh, Wilhelmi Buchinger Clinic in Germany and True North. And they couldn't have been more different in in a whole <laughs> bunch of ways from what they're at, what fasting actually means to them, whether it's the water only fasting at True North or the 250 calorie a day regimen uh, in, in Buchinger, um, whether it's the advice you get for how to break the fast and re, you know, return to life, uh, whether it's the setting of you know beautiful alpine mountains and meadows or a you know a, a sort of grim converted apartment complex in Santa Rosa, uh, what what did you make of you know that? the huge range in differences and which, you know, what did, what did you like? And, you know, if you were to create a fasting clinic, what would it have? Yeah. So um, I will preface this by saying, because it, I'm going to sound awfully complimentary here. Uh, I'm not a booster. I'm not recommending either of these clinics. As you know, from, from reading my chapters, I'm critical where I think they deserve criticism. Having said that, I think they are both fantastic. These are incredible institutions. The Buchinger Wilhelmi Clinic in Germany has been open for uh, more than a century. They have had more than a quarter million people come through their door. They have a satellite in, in uh, Spain as well, another campus down there. And, and the form of practice, that the, the form of fasting that they practice, uh, which is the form most commonly practiced in Germany, is uh, what I would call modified fasting. And so what that is, is you take 250 calories a day, mostly in vegetable, vegetable broths, uh, some tea with honey, some fruit juices if you want, but no more than 250 calories a day. And what that does is it's few enough calories that your body is not kicked out of fasting metabolism, right? The, one of the hallmarks of fasting metabolism, it's not the only one, the ketogenic folks go a little overboard on this, but is being in the state of ketosis. You will stay in ketosis if you're having 250 calories a day of broth. However, it's just enough calories that you're making, you're, you're processing this glucose, so you have energy to do things. So they take, you know, every single day, there is a hike out in the hills for an hour, hour and a half, maybe two hours or so. Um, you know, you can do um, yoga and stretching and, uh, you know, pool classes. There's a gym. There's, you know, there, there's, there are all these things that you are able to do when you have just a little bit of glucose supplied. And they've sort of taken that model and run with it. And what it really is, 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 is a spa. Um, people go there for their vacations. Um, you know, some people say, you know, I could have gone on a, a cruise ship for, you know, two weeks and, you know, gone back home uh, fatter and with less energy than I had before I left. Or I could come here, do this and feel absolutely fantastic and re-energized. And that's certainly the way Buchinger Wilhelmi has pitched themselves. Um, and so most people are coming for a reset. Some are coming to lose weight. There aren't as many people who are going there as are going to True North, percentage-wise, uh, to cure diseases. And that's because, um, I, I think, the, um, the curative power of fasting is blunted somewhat by um, any number of calories that you take during the fast. So that is not to say you cannot achieve cures. I met many people who had come for diseases. At the time that I was there, I kept running into people who had come with fibromyalgia, which is this disease where the nervous system goes haywire and all your joints and muscles just become these agonizing sites of pain. It's just a savage, savage disease. People would walk in, you know, hunched over, crippled, barely able to get up off their bed once they got in. A week later, they'd be hiking. Uh, two weeks later, three weeks later, four weeks later, they'd be walking out carrying their own luggage. Um, just incredible turnarounds. Uh, so, so that brings us to True North in um, California. Completely the opposite, right? Um, what they what they are doing is water only fasting. Um, and um, if you if you are unable to do that, 
Um, they will gladly, you know, put you on a modified fast. They use mostly sort of green smoothies and so on. But but the thing that they really want to do is water only fasting. And, and they want to do that because they are much, much more focused on we want to cure you of what you've got rather than you're here for a reset and a recharge kind of spa experience. Um, and it is sort of <laughs> what to me is is a grim uh, apartment. Con- it's, it's not as as grim as I probably, you know, sometimes envision it in my head and my memories of it, but it's just sort of a, you know, a, a sad seventies, you know, suburban, um, uh, style, uh, apartment complex that they've converted and everyone lodges in these rooms in this little apartment compound. Um, and, and they've done what they can to make it, you know, as, as lovely as possible, but they're working on a very limited budget for a very important reason. What Alan Goldhammer, the director says is, look, I could raise my prices and I could do a Buchinger will help me thing. And he's got great respect for them. He's not dissing them, but I could do a Buchinger will help me thing, but then people wouldn't stay as long. You know, the, the cheapest room at, um, at Buchinger will help me probably, I don't know what exactly it translates to now, but about $300 a night um, for, uh, 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 excuse me, True North, it's about $200 a night, which allows people to stay longer, which allows them to get better, which is good both for them and for the studies that True North's research foundation is trying to conduct on them. See, they want to prove at long last that we have the science to show that all these you know, conditions that people come to us with, that many of them can be cured through fasting. So they want people to stay long enough to get well. Bukinger will help me does too. They have a research arm as well that's also impressive and fantastic. Um, but it's really just the laser-centered focus at True North. Um, so to wrap up, I, I would say then, as you alluded to, you're absolutely right. What the other big difference is when you come out of a fast at True North, they tell you, look, your diseases are going to come back if you don't eat a plant-based diet. In fact, they don't say a plant-based diet. They say a 100% minimally processed diet of plants with no added salt, oil, or sugar. They give you all kinds of indoctrination. I say that in the nicest possible way while you're there about why they think this is the best diet for you to eat. At Buchinger Wilhelmi, they say, eh, for a couple of weeks after your fast, you know, eat as many plants as possible. Don't eat a lot of processed food. But after that, you can kind of go back to the crap you were eating, <laughs> which... I understand why they're saying that. Um, they don't want to put too much pressure on people. Everyone has enough shoulds and you ought to in their lives already. So they're trying to get people to make small steps. Um, but um, in answer to your question, which um, system would I, you know, which if I had my own fasting clinic, which way would I go? It would be some kind of hybrid. I would, I would like to have uh, a beautiful building in which to, and a beautiful grounds in which to fast. But I'd also, I also think it's true that you should tell people, I think uh, Goldhammer and company have it right. Look, you are going to be vastly healthier the closer you can stick to a 100% minimally processed diet of plants, preferably with no added salt, oil, or sugar. So I know we're we're coming up on the we passed the hour. So I want to let you. I'm sure you've got you've got a lot of media to do because your book comes out uh, for us tomorrow. People will be hearing this on September 6. It will be today, so you can go order it right away. The oldest cure in the world. I guess I'm curious. Um, you know, you've written other books. You've written about you know the um, pol- you know sort of political issues, uh, you know, sort of, and you kind of put a stake in the ground with this book. And I'm thinking about another book that I read a year and a half ago, um, or maybe more now, by James Nestor called Breath. And he did a very similar thing looking yeah. at the history of breathing and breathing practices. And he became sort of a breathing guru, I think, without, you know, he says, like, I'm just the student. I'm pointing you towards, like, I, I hope this book does, you know, that well or better. Um, I know breathing is probably a little less hard for people to accept than fasting because they're probably, you know, they think of themselves as breathers already. Um, but like, what's your sort of wildest fantasy about where this book takes you? <laughs> oh, gosh. You know, so first of all, yeah, absolutely. Uh, for your listeners, if you haven't read James Nestor's Breath, um, go grab it. It's a fantastic book. It's not perfect. I wish it had a little more depth and detail and so on, but he does such a good job 
Um, uh, and it is a wonderful entry into basically how to nose breathe to improve your health. Um, so yeah, yeah, wildest fantasy in my most like, you know, um, mercenary, you know, want to be a success uh, kind of way is, is something like that. Uh, something that's an international bestseller and wins, you know, huge awards and all that. To tell the truth though, Howie, like, and, and I'm really not just blowing smoke up your ass with this. I get a kick when I'm talking to one person. I mean, I know when I'm talking with you, I'm talking to, you know, thousands of people, but, but, but you know, if I go, go to a bookstore reading and there are six people there and those people, you know, take what I say to heart and think about it, digest it, and maybe, you know, walk away and uh, try to change their health a little bit. I just think that's fantastic. So I will be happy getting this message out to whoever wants to get it, at, you know, whoever wants to receive it. And for that matter, whoever wants, I hope, to just uh, enjoy reading a, a well-written book. That's that's also a huge piece of mine. You know, it, it, it's unusual that People comment on the quality of my writing, but every time they do and say things like you said in the, in the intro, um, I'm deeply moved by that. But, you know, what do I expect will happen? It's a real mix. It's really interesting. The, the pre-release uh, publicity stuff that I'm doing has been really interesting. It's been almost an education. So, as you know, a big undercurrent of the book is, yeah, fasting's great. Probably these diseases that you reverse through fasting, a lot of them are going to come back if you don't adopt some form of a plant-based diet. Um, so I thought that when I was going out and trying to get the, the uh, you know, you, you, you go around to people and give them your manuscript before you publish the book, right? And ask, you know, if, if you like what you read, would you write a blurb that I can put on the back of the book? I went to, and I won't mention any by name, but I went to the, some of the biggest plant-based doctors in the field. Um, and virtually all of them said no, or just didn't respond, which surprised me. And so I'm, what I'm really curious about, um, uh, cause, cause I think of this, you know, your podcast, for instance, as my natural habitat. I mean, I've listened to your podcast before. Um, I've listened to a lot of the guests who are on your podcast before. I just think, you know, these are my people. Yeah. Uh, and so far a lot of the plant-based people have been, well, you know, we'll kind of wait and see. And I'm not, quite sure what's up with that. I, I have a suspicion. I don't know this. I, I, should, I should say Dr. Joel Kahn, the cardiac doctor, cardiologist, um, was, the, was the exception. He said absolutely, but he's someone who uses fasting in his own practice. Mm -hmm. So he had a reason to already be partial to this. I have a suspicion um, from you know talking with people who fast and being on these uh, you know Reddit subs and so on and looking at what people are saying, there's a fear out there among possibly among some of the uh, vegan doctors uh, that look if we people so a lot of people seem to think that if you fast you can do that for your health you don't have to switch your diet. So I wonder if people are a little hesitant to be supportive of the book for that reason. Mm. I'm not sure. That's a that's a speculation. I wonder also, um, but for whatever reason, um, yeah, I wonder also if go if, ahead. Um, if if they think of fasting as sort of a gateway drug to to ketogenic diets, since the word keto appears in ketosis, <laughs> and you know the Bookinger Wilhelmy folks were telling people eighty percent fat might not be a bad idea. Yeah, yeah, you you may well be right because certainly if you look at the um, the numbers of people who are online talking about fasting and doing a ketogenic diet, it is huge. It is unfortunately, uh, to my way of thinking, fasting has become tainted with the ketogenic diet. And I'll just I know we're running out of time, but I'll just say briefly here: it's an understandable idea that well, if fasting is good for you and you're in ketosis when fasting, shouldn't we be in ketosis? all the time, right? Hence, we should eat the ketogenic diet. But as uh, many people have said, um, my, I think Michael Clapper, for instance, says, well, look, there are lots of great therapies out there. Uh, chemotherapy is a great therapy. Uh, you know, it can be curative, but you don't want to be doing that all the time. Ketosis is a very highly acidic state. Uh, it can be very hard on the body. It's a great temporary thing to be in every once in a while. But you know, exercise is great. Should you be exercising 24 hours a day? Probably not, right? right. So, um, but you're right. Um, because there is this association in so many people's mind of fasting and the ketogenic diet, 
um, it can be a little bit of a third rail. So uh, for people who are on the plant-based side of things, so, you know, knock wood, maybe my, um, maybe my book will help dispel a little bit of that. Well, I certainly hope you are embraced by the plant based community because you absolutely should be. And, you know, your your list of resources at the end of the book includes two two works that I had a hand in. So I'm I certainly think it's a comprehensive list. Um, and I mean, the writing is so good, like I don't care who you are, like the just the, the historical stories. And, you know, any book that has the sentence um, where talking about Sylvester Graham's views on orgasm as the convulsive paroxysm attending venereal indulgence should should win a Pulitzer just for that. So, but. <laughs> well, thank you. That's very kind. <laughs> so I, I, I hope I hope this goes widespread because it's um, it's a really important work. It's a, you know, fasting and all its cognates are a foundational practice that can that can liberate us um, and can allow us to stand on our own feet when it comes to health. And it was such a pleasure to read. I wish I'd given myself a week because I haven't. I actually I, I did. I haven't gone through all the footnotes. So, in fact, I had a bunch of questions like you did such a good job of telling the story of Colin Campbell with True North. And I've known Colin for, you know, 18 years now, and I've talked to him a lot and I've never heard those stories. So I'm like jealous that you're a better interviewer than I am. Um, whether, you know, you, you read, the, well, you know, yeah, go ahead. A, a lot of those. Yeah. A lot of those stories, uh, you know, those stories about Campbell actually came from, in fact, other podcasts and other interviews he had done with different magazines. And I was not, you know, I'd read the China study. I'd seen forks over knives and all that stuff. And I was not aware of it either. And it was when um, interviewing Goldhammer and doing some research on him. And he mentioned that he really got his research start from working with Colin Campbell. Um, but I thought, well, well, let's look into this. How did Campbell become interested in this? And then to find that he had this horrific story of this disorder that he had that was going to rob him of his voice and possibly close off his, his, his throat and kill him. He had to, you know, as I mentioned in the book, walk around with a pen knife for an, a period of time in case his muscles locked down the, the, the throat airway there in order to cut himself open and do an emergency tracheotomy. I mean, it was just really, wow. It, and you're right. It's not something that um, he has talked about a lot but he's uh, candid about it when people have asked him. Uh, and it was a pleasure to get to relate that story. I thought it was a powerful one. Mm -hmm. Did you um, talk with him for the book? You know, I actually have not actually spoken with him. So I have uh, emailed with him yeah. and he was very helpful in answering, you know, any questions I had. But for some of these people, you know, one of the fascinating things about podcasts is, you know, if, if I read an interview and it's on paper, uh, I, you know, if I can, and I have the time, I really want to talk with someone and make sure that everything got down right. If someone's just speaking the way I am, well, you've already got your interview with yeah. them. Uh, and it's, yeah. it's better if you can speak with them, if you have more questions, of course, to ask more questions. But that was one of those rare, rare, but very, I wouldn't say rare, less common, but very pleasant cases where he had covered this so well himself in the interviews that he gave. I didn't feel I needed to waste his time. Now, if he were Joe Blow, um, who didn't have 28,000 demands on his time and, and 38 requests from media every week, you know, pestering him, um, I would have gotten in touch uh -huh. uh, and had a nice long talk and said, okay, well, walk me through all this. Let's make sure I've got it right. But uh, emailing him and basically saying, you know, do I have this right? Do I have that right? Is this, you mm -hmm. know, this wrong, whatever. Um, that, that was, <laughs> it's, it's one of the beauties of the internet age. That's, that's a plus. Yeah, nice. So I, I hope he's got a copy of the book. I think the publisher has sent him one, so I'll double check that and make sure. Good, because so, uh, we gotta, yeah. This 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 message needs to be spread, and you know, you've you've written a book that is eminently readable and shareable and talk aboutable. So uh, I'd be an, I'd be an honor to be part of the the first wave of getting it out into the world uh, the the way it should the way it deserves to be. So, well. Uh, I really appreciate the chance to come on your show. Thanks for having me. Oh, it was a pleasure and an honor. I want to have you back because um, I have another book in the stack. I can't even remember something about the FBI or the CIA or Indian country. 
I, I, I yeah. don't even, I yeah, don't even but, remember, but I know it was interesting enough that when I read it, I said, I want to talk about that one too. So, uh, when <laughs> I would be delighted when, when the, when all the excite when the first wave of excitement of the oldest cure in the world, um, abates, well, I have a chance to read the other one. We'll, we'll, we'll meet again. Good. That sounds fantastic. Cool. So you tell, tell us your website one more time. Sure. It's just my name, which is Steve Hendricks with a CKS on the end, stevehendricks.org. And I'm not a big, huge social media person. I'm there a little bit, but the best place to, to contact with me is to go to my website and my email is on there. And if you want to get in touch, just feel free to shoot me a line. Awesome. And the book is The Oldest Cure in the World. Go get it. It will be, it will be worth your time. Steve Hendricks, thank you so much for writing it and for taking the time today.